Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're here, so here to do a webinar on essential copyright knowledge, a toolkit for teachers and librarians. Uh, my name is Meredith Jacob, and I work at American University Washington College of Law. I'm going to just let you know about the panelists briefly while people join the webinar, and then we'll jump in. I'm joined by Professor Peter Yazzi, a professor emeritus at American University's Washington College of Law, where he helped found the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic and the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. He's an expert on copyright and fair use and a leader of our ongoing project working with communities to draft best practices in fair use. I'm also joined by Prue Adler, who currently works with us at the Washington College of Law on those best practices. Prior to that work, she was the Associate Executive Director of the Association of Research Libraries. And one highlight of her work there was work on the Marrakesh Treaty, an international copyright treaty to facilitate access to published works for people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. I'm joined by Michael Carroll, a professor of law and director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property, PIGIP. There he teaches and writes about intellectual property law and cyber law. And Professor Carroll is also a founding member of Creative Commons and an expert on copyright in the digital world. We're further joined by Will Cross, the director of copyright and digital scholar, the, sorry, the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries. And there he's a lawyer and a librarian where he speaks and writes on open culture, navigating legal uncertainty, and copyright law for uh, librarians and educators. He's also a collaborator on our best practices and fair use for authors of OER. We are joined by Jonathan Band, a lawyer in private practice who has written and worked extensively on copyright, both domestically and internationally, and who has also done work representing library communities in questions of copyright and fair use. We're finally joined by Christina Ishmael, who is a senior project man manager of the teaching, learning, and tech team for the education policy group at New America. And in that work, she supports states, districts, and educators who are rethinking the role of instructional materials to create deeper learning opportunities for students. Before joining New America, Christina was the K-12 Open Education Fellow at the Office of EdTech, where she developed and grew the Go Open movement. And prior to that, she was a digital learning, special, digital learning specialist for the Nebraska Department of Education. Christina is one of our longtime collaborators, and without this project, without her, this project would not be possible. So thank you, Christina. So um, on the next slide, you'll see a brief overview of what we're going to go over. We're going to talk about why we care about copyright at all, the goals of copyright today, um, the relationship between copyright and teaching. You know, why is copyright sort of bound up with teaching? And then we'll also talk about what copyright covers and what it doesn't, taking a closer look at fair use, and then finally uh, diving into some questions about copyright and how it relates to the risk that schools do or don't face. So to get us started, we're going to have Professor Michael Carroll talking about sort of foundational ideas in copyright. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, and. Uh, as happened with our last webinar, I teach on Tuesday, so I'll be able to join you for now, but uh, we'll have to drop off before the end of the uh, webinar, but happy to help with any follow-up uh, that may happen. Uh, so why copyright? We're <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about the way the law has created a sort of structure around the rights of creators and the rights of users, and then how copyright sort of manages that structure. Um, so if we can have the next slide. Um, the basic idea is uh, in the Constitution, you want copyright's job is to promote the progress of science and useful arts, where the word science meant knowledge more generally uh, at the time. And the idea was that by creating an exclusive right for book publishers and others, uh, that would be the way knowledge would spread, is that you had to create an economic incentive for someone to take a risk on a new title or a new uh, creative work. And the risk is that uh, someone else in the publishing business could just wait for the first copy to be successful and then simply copy that and, and, um, and make all the money or take away the profit. So the, what copyright does is it makes certain kinds of uses of works 
unlawful unless you have permission. And that's what that's the incentive then is that uh, the reason someone might want to invest in creating or distributing creative works is to get the reward from uh, a successful work that that gathers an audience and know that there's some protection against a competitor swooping in and just uh, providing cheap alternative copies. Uh, but the ultimate goal, and our Supreme Court has said this on more than one occasion, is to is the general public interest. The reason that there are these private rights that are given to uh, creators and publishers is to create this incentive that ultimately makes the knowledge created and distributed. Um, and if we could have the next slide. So what you get is a balance in the law. The law provides a set of exclusive rights uh, given to the original creator and then anyone who has those rights transferred to them. And as I was mentioning, the, the goal are to provide legal protection against direct competition in the marketplace or uh, uses that, that the law thinks you need to get permission for or you need to get a license for. So those are the types of uses that go directly to the economic reward of having created a successful work. But the law also recognizes that there are many other uses of those works, and here we can think about educational works or works written for popular culture um, that do not need a license and that should be encouraged as part of the scheme to, to promote the overall uh, system of creativity and the distribution of creativity. So not all licenses need, I'm sorry, not all uses of copyrighted works need a license and they don't need permission. Um, and this is really important. There may be rights owners that would be happy to give you a license, um, but it doesn't mean necessarily that you need that license. Um, so one example I can think of is a, a English professor who wanted to quote two lines from a Bob Dylan song at the opening of a chapter in his academic book. And the publisher of Bob Dylan's lyrics said, sure, I'll give you a, a license for $3,000. Well, that, that, you don't need a license to quote two lines from a Bob Dylan song in an academic book. Doesn't mean that if you're basically offering free money, the copyright owner might well take it. So it's really important to understand this, this concept that not all uses need a license. And in particular, you'll be hearing more about fair use. Fair use is a core provision that defines a, an analysis by which you identify the kinds of uses that don't interfere with the copyright owner's basic economic rights and are, are permitted under fair use without a license. And so um, I, I'm gonna turn it over, but the, this is the, the basic idea is that from its beginning, uh, copyright has been about promoting education and knowledge through a balance of incentives for the creators and publishers of those works, while also leaving space for users to, to have their own creativity in the way that many of you are now being forced to do when you're online. Um, and that's part of the scheme. Part of the beauty of copyright is that you don't have to have specific permissions in the law. Fair use provides enough flexibility to deal even with the kinds of circumstances we're dealing with now. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, and up next, we have uh, Professor Peter Yazzi, who's gonna talk a little bit more about how those goals of copyright that Professor Carroll talked about apply to sort of our view of copyright today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you, Michael, for that, that, that wonderful lead in. The, the first point I wanna make is a very general one, which will, I think, echo through a number of the presentations today, and that is that the copyright system is a, is a dynamic system. It's the copyright law is updated occasionally by Congress, and it is kept up to date by courts that hear and decide cases in which they have to interpret and apply the law. But there are also larger movements in the legal frame of uh, the, in the frame in which all of our laws operate that affect and and help to to maintain the dynamism of copyright law so the 
the fundamental constitutional goals of our system, as, as, as Michael described them a moment ago, remain the same centuries later. But there are some really interesting and important overlays that have been added to our understanding of the purposes of copyright. And one of those is, of course, the function of the post-war development, post-World War II development of the concept of human rights. And so just as all the laws that every country of the, the civilized world um, enacts and applies are subject to the the basic requirements of human rights doctrine, so it is with copyright in the United States. And I won't, I won't read you, but you can see here on this slide an example, that is to say the Article 26 guarantee of a right to education and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As we think about and apply copyright today, we have to bear in mind that we are part of an international legal system which recognizes that right to education. Next slide, please. There are also some other important overlays, not inconsistent with the original goal of copyright by any means, but elaborations of that goal or those goals for our present time. We are these days perhaps more acutely aware than the, the first American Congress was in 1790 of the importance of equitable distribution of goods and benefits within our society. And so copyright, the interpretation and application of copyright law is informed in particular by the notion that as Michael said, everyone has user rights, and those user rights ought to be enjoyed equally by all members of our society. And that, in turn, brings us to the, the consideration of new technology. Copyright itself, in its original European history, is in some sense the the offspring of a great change in technology, that is the introduction of movable type. Today we are coping with another equally ethical change, the introduction of widespread digital technology. And copyright needs to, and I think there's the broadest possible agreement that copyright needs to help all members of society realize the promise of those new technologies. A lot of the points I've just been making could be summed up in a catchphrase, access to knowledge, which you may well have heard, and is used casually, but, but meaningfully in both international and domestic copyright discourse. And it's a theme that will reoccur in today's presentations and in the series of webinars that we are introducing. Next slide, please. At the international level, speaking for a moment of open educational resources, there are other indications that the, the general themes of copyright in, in the new themes in copyright law or the, the, the new variations on the old themes in copyright law that I have just been summarizing are important. So here is the text or a part of the text of last year's UNESCO recommendation on open educational resources, a document to which the United States is by the way, fully committed. And you'll see that point three emphasizes the importance of encouraging inclusive and equitable access to OER. Again, that declaration, that recommendation is not only about copyright, but it is among other things about copyright because copyright, as we see, is crucial to the development of OER. Next, please. I want to pause for a moment on a particular instance of the general principles that I've just been describing. And that is the, if you will, the, the case of accessibility. Uh, this is a, a theme that has become extremely important in both international and US law in the last several decades. And 
it has necessarily colored and influenced the way we think about copyright law. So both Congress and the courts have acknowledged the importance of accessibility in shaping copyright policy, including the interpretation of copyright law. There is a case, a recent case, Authors Guild Against Hottie Trust, in which the Second Circuit Court of Appeals begins its discussion of a copyright fair use issue by referencing the Americans for Disabilities Act. Now, that's a case that is dealing with the issue of taking advantage of the flexibilities of copyright law to make texts available to the blind and visually impaired. And we also see that the United States was a leader in the movement to inscribe that right to read for the blind and visually impaired into international copyright law with the 2013 Marrakesh Treaty. So the U.S. is in effect all in on the notion that contemporary copyright policy needs to be shaped that contemporary copyright law needs to be applied with accessibility in mind. Next slide. I want to pause a little further on this theme of accessibility because an interesting question arises in thinking about it, and that is, who benefits from interpretations and applications of copyright law or interpretations and applications of law in general that, that have the effect of promoting access for communities with particular disabilities, whether they're physical disabilities, perceptual disabilities, or disabilities relating to uh, text processing. And, and here, I think the quote from Ronald Mace, one of the the pioneers of the field that has become known as universal design is important. Again, I won't, well, maybe I will. Universal design is designed for the built environment and for consumer products for a very broad range of def, broad range definition of user that encourages attractive marketable products that are more usable by everyone. In other words, when we adapt our practices when we interpret our laws to permit the adaptation of our practices in ways that make something important, be it the, the, the access to the street or to a building on the one hand or access to texts on the other, for one group within our society, we end up benefiting everyone. In the case of, of ramps and curb cuts is a classic example. Uh, anyone who's, who's ever been a, 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 cycle, a cyclist knows that those curb cuts that were installed for the benefit of the disabled are sometimes very, very useful to you as well. And so to the building ramps that um, we all have learned sometimes at least to love. Large print labels are another example. There's a particular community that is primarily benefited by large print labels. But as I get older, I can tell you, even though I may not qualify entirely as the intended beneficiary of large print labels, I am very, very happy that they're around. And versatile digital texts, that is fully featured digital texts in, in, in conventional languages that incorporate the essential features of the text, not only the, the words on the page, but the design features, be, whether we're talking about EPUB 2 or we're talking about DAISY or even, a, even HTML, virtual digital text, even though it was originally conceived of as being useful in particular for one community, turns out to be valuable to us all. So just a few of examples of this principle of universal design. What we do for some ends up redounding to our benefit across the board. And with that, I think I'm done and we'll turn it over.
Thank you, Peter. Christina? Um, well, so, you know, we had Professor Carroll and Professor Yazzie tell us that copyright law is really intended to incentivize innovation and incentivize stuff being available in society for authors to write so people can read and that education is a purpose that was really embedded in copyright law from the beginning. And then we've heard from uh, Peter Yazi that this idea that you should also make those educational materials accessible and that they should be available to all your students equally, that these are both ideas that are really core to how we think about copyright. And at the same time, that should set us up to say, okay, there's not a conflict between copyright law and education. But there's still a lot of um, confusion and concern, as the slide says, <laughs> the relationship <There> is. <laughs> between copyright and what you do in teaching. And Christina, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your experience with that and where you think some of that might have come from. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me and for being the representative of educators. <laughs> um, so whenever I first started to kind of look at all of these pieces and this title in particular on this slide, I was like, why do educators worry so much about it or do they not worry about it? Um, and it really kind of depends. Uh, so when we first think about it, we want to obviously model best practices and doing the right thing for our students. Um, that's across the board. So it's not something that is typically covered in teacher prep programs. And so we don't know what we don't know. Um, so whenever we get into a lot of school systems, uh, we may have support through professional development and uh, actual support with the help of our school librarians or even administrators that can kind of guide us in, the, in these conversations. But a lot of times we don't. And so we want to model what's best and kind of those best practices when it comes to using copyrighted content. Um, but sometimes we just don't know. We also have other concerns as far as aggressive messages that come from the rights holders themselves. So there, with this quick shift to remote learning, uh, there were a lot of authors and publishing companies that came out right away and said, you know, like you can or you cannot use our content. The same goes back for, you know, hundreds of years probably um, when we look at copyrighted content and that there are a lot of folks that say no you cannot use this um, even though it's considered educational purposes and things like that so we get a lot of mixed messages but we also get aggressive messages uh, and that can come through you know our own district leadership down to individual educators in the classroom that can also come from uh, even some IT folks that say hey we've got access to you know these materials and these tools but we may not be able to use them uh, appropriate or not appropriately but within the the confines of copyright then we have uh, quote unquote experts uh, that are putting out a whole host of things including guidelines which are kind of the next two bullet points I remember when I first entered the classroom in 2005 uh, there was a, a document that went around that was guidelines for um, fair use and kind of best practices around the use of materials and it was digital and analog this still exists I've still seen this screenshotted and used in presentations and these are guidelines very loosely used uh, term guidelines and they're not really they're not the law by any means um, this is where we had the whole idea of like you can use 30 seconds of a song or less or you can use 30 seconds of a, a movie or less or you know like a scene from a movie and so we've had this uh, this this message continue to come out saying like these are the things you can and cannot do when that's actually not true uh, and, and in fact working with you all uh, in in doing all of this work I've learned a lot even since um, things that I probably told other teachers was like yeah that's probably not the best idea and actually you probably could do it because it is for educational purposes so it does, um, there are a lot of factors. And, and if we look at those last two, it's that lack of instruction, or excuse me, institutional support and guidelines. Um, we just don't know, we don't know. So we have a lot of leaders that are in positions that say, oh yeah, it's fine, we can claim that as fair use, when that may not always be the case, but a lot of times it is the case. And so uh, we also hear horror stories, unfortunately. We hear of the school librarian who was fined and put in jail because of breaking copyright and disseminating information. And, and we hear about school districts that are fined millions of dollars and so there's just this fear um, that is invoked by by people and by systems um, and we just we have kind of this gray area that we live in from time to time and well, or most of the time I should say and uh, it's helpful to be able to have some of these conversations well I may not always understand 
all of the um, specific legal jargon that Peter talks about. Um, it, it is really helpful to hear directly from folks that understand this work um, deeply to know that most often we're within our rights because we are using it to help teach. Um, the next one, the next slide is really to kind of how to overcome that anxiety. First of all, take a breath. <laughs> um, no one is here to turn you in. No one is here to uh, like do any sort of fear mongering. Um, I'm, I'm quite guilty of that myself. When I worked at the state level in Nebraska, I worked very closely with our school librarians across the entire state and did a lot of training on copyright, fair use, and creative commons and would go through different scenarios and say, have you done this? Did you know that technically that is, that's not allowed? And so we would try to do alternatives and, and create different scenarios and look at things that are Creative Commons licensed so we weren't having to worry about copyright. Um, but I think it's also really important to just take a breath. Um, seek out those resources, the best practices documents. You will see a link here that is um, for best practices when it comes to copyrighted content. Uh, and then there is also one in the works right now for OER, which makes me very happy. But I think it's really important to know uh, that we are trying to push this information out into pre-service programs. Uh, it's not something that is really talked about. So we want to make sure that people are addressing that, whether that is in a reading methods course, a math methods course, whatever it may be, it is not strictly the onus of the ed tech course or the ed tech instructor to be able to get this information out. So we really wanna get that out as, as far and wide as possible. It's also just having that conversation, not saying that you want to go and tattle on someone by any means, but having that conversation saying, hey, did you know that this may or may not really be appropriate to do uh, in a classroom or that it may or may not be appropriate to make this, this many copies or whatever. And just having that conversation and then seeking out uh, answers in order to help us in those certain scenarios are is these are all ways that you can kind of manage and cope with that anxiety. It also helps to know people like Meredith and everyone and be like, hey, phone a friend. What about this scenario? <laughs> and we get a lot of these kinds of questions online, which is great because we can actually help find the answers too. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, and I yeah. think you know it's really important because the building the connections with people who can help you get answers and get you sort of off of that spot where you're stuck. Because I think a lot of, you know, teachers and librarians and ed tech specialists, if they're at a point where they don't feel like they have enough information, then it can feel safer to say no. And yeah. our hope here is to help there be enough information that it can feel good and safe and aligned with your educational goals to say, yeah, I think you can do that. Absolutely. Um, and so a little bit later in the presentation, we're going to hear about why the risks and the fears are probably a little bit overblown and the risk is sort of more limited. But before we get to that, um, to maybe start from the beginning and make sure everyone's starting with the same amount of information, Will Cross is going to tell us a little bit about the very basic con confines of copyright, what copyright does cover, and as importantly, what it doesn't cover. So thanks for joining us today, Will. Great, thank you, Meredith, and thank you, Christina, as well. Let's overcome some anxiety right now. Um, as Meredith said, I'm gonna sort of continue this theme of copyright as fundamentally about balance, and this idea that mission should be your North Star, that when you're doing what a good teacher would do, what a good librarian would do, copyright, by and large, is a system that's designed, when functioning well, to support that kind of activity. Um, so I'm gonna try to spell out some of those fundamentals so we have a shared vocabulary. Uh, and then I'm gonna tee up Meredith to get into the good stuff of fair use as well. Um, so thank you for, for coming to this slide now. Um, so as, as Mike Carroll said earlier, and I think everybody has said in one way or another, copyright is really about balance. And the way the law does that is that copyright can protect a huge amount of material, but rights holders can only limit use of copyrighted material in certain ways. Um, so, so as you can see here, for something to be protected by copyright, it has to be an original work of authorship. Uh, we often say that for copyright, you need originality, creativity, and fixation, meaning other people can see it some way. Um, we tend to see that applied to literary, artistic, and musical works. Um, it's also the case that copyright is broad in the sense that it happens automatically and that it lasts for a long, long time time. Uh, copyright today lasts for the life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years for an institutional author. Um, so if you're sitting here listening to this presentation and you're also back channeling on Twitter going, oh my god, this guy is so boring. Why won't he shut up? God, this is dry. Good news. You're a rights holder. 
you own copyright in that snarky sort of tweet at this point. So it's really easy to get copyright. And once you've got it, uh, it lasts for a long time. Um, but not forever. Um, we're, we're sort of light peddling the public domain piece today, but I wanted to make sure we said it, um, that copyright expires and that's a feature, not a bug in the system. Like Lana Del Rey, copyright is born to die. And one of the main purposes of copyright that we have, thank you for laughing at my joke, Meredith, um, is this idea that copyright exists to stock a robust public domain. So if you're using something without permission and your instinct is like, something must be wrong, I didn't get permission. Copyrights should be doing different here. No, in fact, copyright is supposed to support access in the ways we've talked about, and the public domain is one of those ways for sure. Um, the other way that copyright is limited, the other way that that balance thing happens is through a set of limitations and exceptions in the body of copyright law. So copyright law first has a whole set of limitations in its scope. Um, a rights holder who has copyright in something like your snarky tweet uh, has the exclusive right, subject to some of the exceptions we'll talk about, to control a specific set of things, reproduction, derivative works, public display and performance, that sort of thing. And that's it. They don't have the universal ability to control what anybody does with anything at any time, right? Someone who owns the rights to a popular song can't necessarily keep me from singing that song in the shower, for example, though my family may wish that they could stop that from happening. Um, likewise, there are a huge set of uses and ideas that are sort of outside the scope of copyright, uh, functional concepts, names, facts, and ideas in particular are not protected by copyright in the first place. Lawyers often talk about this as the idea expression dichotomy, and it's the idea that copyright protects the expression of a work, but not the idea underlying it. So if I have a great idea for a book about a boy wizard who goes off to wizarding school and makes friends and has adventures, I can write that book. If I call him Harry Potter, that's a problem. If he goes to Hogwarts, we're starting to maybe have some concerns. But from copyright's perspective, the idea is not protected in the first place. What that means for educators is that there are a huge set of practices where copyright just doesn't get in the way in the way we might imagine. It. So for example, if there's a worksheet you really like that takes a concept and spells it out, the idea for the worksheet isn't protected by copyright. The concepts being protected, being presented are not protected by copyright. And in some cases, even a set of written instructions may not be protected because the idea and the expression are merged in certain ways. And that's a little, copyright geekier than we probably want to get into now, but we're happy to, to geek out with you later if you're interested in that stuff. So that's one way that the broad subject matter of copyright is limited and balanced, a set of limitations. The second way that copyright is balanced is through a set of specific and general exceptions that have been, been created. There are whole swaths of uses and areas where the statute or the body of case law has said, copyright just gets in the way here. The purpose of copyright is this access and this promotion of, of the progress of science and the useful arts. Um, if we enforced copyright strictly, that would get in the way of rather than forward that mission. The most common examples of those that educators tend to bump into are in sections 108 and 110 of the copyright law. 108 is the library copyright exception. 110 is the classroom teaching exception. And those were places where Congress just said specifically, librarians, teachers, what you do every day promotes the progress of science and the useful arts. If we brought copyright too heavily into this area, it would be a problem. So 110.1 specifically says it's not a violation of copyright to perform or display a legal copy of a work as part of classroom instruction. We're doing a unit on jazz, we're gonna play a song, great. Don't worry about copyright, you're fine. We're, we're reading a play and we're gonna have students stand up and they're each gonna read a character, wonderful don't sweat copyright, you're A-OK. -okay. We're talking about um, the history of movies and we're gonna show a movie, yes, even a Disney movie, wonderful. Co Congress said, we're gonna carve out a specific exception that says it's okay to do that. That's how libraries do interlibrary loan and certain types of scanning for preservation. Um, and there's a whole suite of these for um, religious institutions, for agricultural affairs. There are, there are whole sort of areas where Congress has said there's a particular group doing particular types of activities that we want to carve out an exception for. In addition to those sort of specific exceptions, there's also this sort of exceptional exception, the fair use exception, where Congress said, in addition to librarians and educators doing the specific things we anticipate, there are also practices that we couldn't have anticipated in 1976. There are 
you know, things that never occurred to us that need to be protected. So we're going to rely on this initially judge-made rule, and we're going to codify it in the statute to say, if a use is fair, go nuts. Do this society-serving thing. And again, uh, Meredith is going to get into that more, but I wanted to sort of point to the difference between a specific exception, which is a specific person doing a specific thing in a specific way, and the flexible fair use doctrine that we're going to talk about more. Next slide, please. And we have a really good case study for the difference between specific and general exceptions here in the case of online education. So our current Copyright Act is the 1976 Copyright Act. Um, back of the envelope calculation, it takes you know, a decade or so to get a statute passed. A lot of the expectations of the people doing the work in the 60s and 70s reflected uh, maybe some times before the current moment. So our former Registrar of Copyright, Mary Beth Peters, has famously said, that what we have today is, quote, a pretty good 1950s Copyright Act. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they weren't thinking a lot about online education in the way we're doing it today. So the specific exceptions they created weren't a great fit for that. That 1101 exception I told you about is imagining somebody standing in front of a blackboard talking to students sitting in uncomfortable wooden desks. So how do we do online instruction if these specific exceptions are out of date and don't fit? Well, one way we could do that is we could update the statute, right? And that's exactly what Congress tried to do in 2002 with the TEACH Act. They said, what if we take 1101, the classroom exception, and right beside it, its next door neighbor will be 1102, and that'll solve the problem. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, the TEACH Act has proved to be um, challenging for people to implement for a variety of different reasons. The scope is sort of cramped in a way that 1101 is not. It's technically difficult to access in a lot of ways. You can kind of see the sausage making happening a little bit more in the TEACH Act than you might with 1101. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with the exceptional exception. That leaves us with fair use that exists as a way to complement and supplement the specific exceptions like section 108 and 110, where Congress has said, we value, we privilege this sort of activity, but the text of the law doesn't necessarily fit. Fair use fits there as a safety net and also as sort of a set of wings to let us fly into new spaces as well, if you'll excuse the sort of creaky metaphor. So in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith, but I wanna take one more second to talk a little bit about what copyright isn't. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, Copyright is often sort of described in a way that, that misunderstands the scope and the limitations we've talked about. Uh, and the easiest example of that is the case of plagiarism. I think anybody who has ever worked in or thought about copyright has had this question, right? If, if I don't cite, that's a copyright violation, right? Or, you know, under copyright, who's first author on that article or that kind of thing? Um, and the interesting thing to note here is that plagiarism is tremendously important as an ethical, as a practitioner norm, but it's not a legal matter. Copyright doesn't have much to say about plagiarism. Um, I've heard it said before that infringe, copyright infringement is illegal and plagiarism is bad manners, which is much worse. Um, I think that's sort of a funny way to think about it. Um, but plagiarism is a thing that we do because it's ethical, because it's professional, because we want to model good behavior, but not because we're afraid we're going to get sued if we don't do it or we don't do it right. Um, so plagiarism is important, not copyright. Uh, likewise, trademark law is an area, sort of a cousin of copyright in a lot of ways. Um, it does cover a lot of those names and logos, the things we said copyright didn't cover earlier. But the good news is trademark also has a set of limitations and exceptions, the result of which is that we probably don't need to worry too much about trademark when we're doing teaching and learning in person or online as well, especially when we're not commercializing anything, when we're not using them in a way that might be confusing to consumers. Um, again, I sort of gesture to trademark to say that's all we need to say about trademark. No, it's out there. No, it's different than copyright. No, it's by and large not a huge concern for your online teaching. Uh, likewise, the same is true for the so-called rights of publicity, right? My students are writing a paper and they wanna talk about um, their experience at McDonald's. Trademark, McDonald's has trademarks, but don't worry about it. Or they wanna talk about why this famous person means a lot to them personally. There is a thing called right of publicity. It shouldn't get in the way of your student's ability or your ability to talk about their lived experiences and complete their academic mission. So that's enough of my sort of over to the side beyond copyright stuff. Um, I promised you a minute ago that Meredith was gonna get to do the really good juicy stuff in fair use. I'm glad to say you are done with me now and Meredith gets to do that. So I'll turn it over to you, Meredith. Or Peter, I'm so sorry.
All right. That's all right. I'm happy to start. Meredith's going to take, I'm going to do the easy part, and Meredith's going to do the hard part of fair use. So the, the easy part is, is to give a kind of very, very broad but very important reassurance about this fair use doctrine, which has been a long round for a long time. The courts created it as a kind of safety valve in the copyright system, a, a general exception to complement and supplement all the specific exceptions as well as explained. And then in 1976, uh, more than a century later, the Congress finally got around to codifying it. And what they did in those days was, at that time, was that they basically went through all of these uh, centuries worth of old cases and tried to, to condense the, the holdings of those cases into the statute. And for a while, I think, after that, in the, in the 80s, for instance, people were a little confused about how reliable, uh, how much weight you could put on this fair use doctrine. And it seemed a bit kind of unpredictable. Um, no longer. The, since the, 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 oh, 25 years ago when the Supreme Court got involved in all of this, when issued a very important clarifying decision, and then subsequently lots of courts have taken the statute and that important Supreme Court decision and applied it in all sorts of circumstances. Right now, really, uh, Fair use has never been more predictable, never been more reliable than it is. And I know this because I have been in this field for 50 some years. And so I've watched really over the course of my fair use turn from a, a mystery into something that will bear a lot of weight comfortably when practitioners are willing to place that weight upon it. So if we go back to that statute, section 107 of the Copyright Act, there are four things that the Congress mentions in that legislation as being important to think about in making a fair use decision, whether you're a, a court making a fair use decision after the fact or whether you're a user, a, a teacher, or a librarian trying to figure out whether or not to rely on fair use before the fact. And those four things are, are why, why, is it, why is the use being made? What kind of material is being used? How much material is being used? And, and what's, the, what's the relevant economic effect on the rights holder of that use? All very nice, all very broad, all very general, all a little hard to get a handle on. And that's where, as I say, this last 25 years of very, very helpful judicial interpretations from the courts comes into play. Next slide, please. In effect, in the last 25 years, what the courts have told us is that there are really only two questions that are of central importance in deciding whether a use was fair or whether a use you're contemplating would be fair if you went ahead and made it in reliance on fair use. And one of them is whether you were doing something new and different with the material, something to use the, the jargon of the, the court cases, transformative. You'll remember that when, when Michael was talking earlier about the purposes of copyright law, he made a point of saying that really it's a kind of competition law. It's a, it's a law that's designed to, to protect people's core markets so that they don't make an investment in writing something or in printing something and then find out that someone else has just swooped in and, and taken the, the market they were aiming at. Well, um, that's why it's so important to ask whether or not a use is transformative because the more likely it is that a, the, the, if a use is transformative, it's just not very likely that it's going to be affecting in any way the original intended core market for that material. The other question the courts want us to ask 
is whether you're using the appropriate amount, not the least possible, not the necessary amount, but the appropriate amount in for whatever your transformative purpose may be. Sometimes that's the whole work, as we'll discuss later perhaps. Sometimes it's a part of the work. And one way or another, if you get in in your in your calculus in your in your planning to the point at which you feel pretty confident that the answers to to both of these questions for your use are yes then you can rely on the fair use doctrine to support you going forward i guess i would just say one more thing about why these these two questions matter and then I'll turn it over to Meredith to do the hard work of explaining how this really works in practice. I mentioned earlier that it's important to ask whether a use is transformative because it affects the, the economic calculus of fair use, but it's also important for another cultural reason. You remember in what Mike, Michael said that, that the, the, the overarching point of copyright law, what we're actually trying to do by creating these limited monopolies for, for first comers, so to speak. The overarching purpose of copyright law is to promote cultural development, to make sure that there's more rather than less knowledge, then to make sure that the knowledge that there is circulates, to make sure that the next generation receives the knowledge that the prior generation has generated. And the new and different uses, transformative uses, be they critical uses, be they illustrative uses, be they educational uses, all serve that overarching goal of assuring the production and circulation of knowledge. And with that, over to you, Meredith. Thank you, Peter. Um, and so, as you've heard so far, um, Michael Carroll has given you sort of the baseline of why we have copyright. And um, Peter talks about how it enables teaching and in, enables teaching for all students. And Christina talked about sort of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt we can exist around copyright. And then Will and Peter gave you a baseline. So hopefully now you're sort of oriented in the copyright world and you know that it affects most written work and photographs, but that it covers the writing or the picture, but not the idea. And so now we're to the question of what does fair use let you do with those written works and those photographs and those copyrighted objects when you're using them for teaching and learning in classrooms. And as Peter sort of teed us up to think, the fundamental question is, why do you want to use them? And that's really important because the purpose of using the work, the teaching mission, the pedagogical purpose, maybe the social purpose in your classroom, it is that purpose that will lead you into your fair use analysis. So Christina said early that some, earlier that some of the hard and fast, you can use 20%, you can use six lines, you can use you know, 120 measures, whatever those arbitrary guidelines are, that they don't really work. And the reason they don't work is they don't cover at all why you are doing something. And so that why is the core question. And so let's talk about some reasons you might use outside copyrighted work in the classroom. You might want to work with your students to do critique or analysis, right? In an English class, you might have students read a paragraph and discuss what is the narrator doing in this paragraph. And so to go through the analysis that Peter set up, the first question would be, what is your purpose? And so your purpose there might be to teach students to try to analyze the, the narrative purpose in a text. And that's really different than the, under, the original purpose of the novel, which is to entertain or to make a moral or societal point. So you're using it for a different purpose. And 
Secondarily, you're not really competing with the novel. No one is gonna say, I'd really like to read that book, but instead I'm gonna go through and carefully stitch together excerpts that different teachers have taken out for worksheets or classroom discussion. So those are the sort of two parts of your analysis. Am I doing a new teaching thing? And could someone reasonably think that this is a way to substitute for the original work? And it's important to remember that it's a, not a question of is it technically possible, but is it a question of are you basically doing the same thing in a way that directly competes for that sale, or are you doing something that is new and different? So purposes that we see as common uh, teaching and learning activities that fall within the types of things Fair Use enables are critique and analysis. Um, and beyond critique and analysis, you can use text or photographs to illustrate an argument. So if you were teaching an environmental studies class, you might use two pictures of a coastline or of an area of land to show how that's changed over time. So you might say, here's a picture of this in, you know, 1925 and then here's a picture of the same place and so you're using that to illustrate a change and you could have selected from different scenes but you still need the picture to illustrate the con the concept you're talking about um there's also questions about copying works to promote accessibility so you might have something in one format but you needed to make a copy and make it into a new format to make it accessible for all of your students and so in that situation, fair use gives you the right to do that. Other situations where changing format might be important is to provide descriptive text or glossing when you are working with, uh, language, with materials for second language learners, both people learning English and then people learning other languages. Um, you might do that to promote media literacy. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of how do we train our students to go out into the world, which is full of more media now. Your students will be exposed to more different types of media and more media that they encounter on their own without a teacher, without a parent. And so it's really important to teach students how to understand source, understand viewpoint, and evaluate the media they see. And in order to do that, you'll need to be able to include examples of that media in a lesson. So you might do a media literacy lesson that had four clips from news articles to compare perspective and compare tone, or you might have one that compared historical coverage of World War II with modern coverage of um, the current virus crisis or modern coverage of the, of, um, the wars in the Middle East. So you might use that contrast. Um, you also may rely on fair use to develop new educational materials. You might um, want to create uh, worksheets or evaluations or other classroom exercises. One of the things we're seeing right now is for many teachers, their lesson planning might be to go over something in the classroom, but they're now needing to shift this to take home materials. So you might want to create take home materials where you used excerpts to create worksheets and other materials that students can complete alone to substitute for discussion-based work that you might have done in the classroom. Um, and then finally, in a broadest sense, one of the other areas that fair use enables is working with orphan works, works that were created, but there isn't a um, ability to get in touch with a rights holder and ask for permission. And in those orphan works, this is often true, particularly for things that weren't created originally for a commercial market. Um, and so on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about situations where you should use caution. So in all of these situations, it's not a hard line that you can't rely on fair use, but these are areas where I'd be a little bit more careful. Um, we talk a lot about knowing what your new purpose is, knowing what your transformative purpose is. And if your purpose is sort of more uh, decorative or aesthetic, that you're doing this to sort of set a mood or grab attention, but you're not doing it for a specific purpose. You just pick this image from a bunch of 
sort of similarly themed ones because you liked how it looked. That not might not be fair use because you don't have a clear teaching purpose. You're not saying I'm doing this for this reason for this class. You're just picking it sort of on a whim. That's probably not as strong a fair use. The next is uses that aren't proportionate. So um, you need to use the amount of a work that is related to what you need to do. And so if you have an exercise where you're asking students to evaluate a specific part of something, then you should use the amount you need. But that is often the whole thing. So in some situations, using um, a portion of the work is appropriate. But in many situations, using a portion of the work actually feels a little absurd. You wouldn't ask students to compare two photographs but feel that you need to crop some of those photographs out. Clearly the photograph is the thing. Um, similarly, I think you would uh, probably raise really strong opinions in the poetry world if you said, we don't really need to read this whole eight line poem. You only need to read these four lines. They're the important ones. So similarly there, if you had your students critiquing or evaluating a poem, they might read the whole thing. But it's important when you make that decision about amount to understand what your use is. And then the final thing here would say, I would say is to be careful when you're using materials that were originally be designed to be educational materials in that commercial context. So it is certainly fair use in some situations to use parts of educational materials or even all of them, but you need to be very careful in your analysis that you're not directly substituting, you're creating something that directly competes with that original thing. So, for example, uh, we could imagine in an online learning context where a teacher might do an introductory vi uh, video to a lesson and read out loud part of the first paragraph of a chapter and say, so this chapter starts, read the first paragraph, and then read a couple of the discussion questions. But then students would read their own copies of that textbook that the school had purchased or had licensed. In that situation, even though you're using a portion of a commercial material, you're using it for a new purpose, which is to orient those students in the text. And so next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So we're going to the next slide. Um, so just briefly to close up, um, back one slide, please. Thanks. Um, so that's a sort of baseline of how to think through fair use. Um, we're gonna have some questions about specific cases at the end of this. And then we'll also be talking in a couple of follow-up webinars about some specific cases for creating educational material. But as Christina noted earlier, one of the things that I think has always been um, maybe overblown is what risk schools and teachers face. And so Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about the structure of the law and how it provides some limits on the risk that schools and teachers face. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you very much, Meredith. If we can go to the next slide, please. So uh, on the one hand, it is true that copyright does provide significant remedies to the rights holders. But there are various uh, factors that limit the, as a practical matter, that limit the exposure that a person, uh, that a teacher or a school system really faces. And so um, I, I will explain some of the risks, but I'll also explain why you don't need to lose too much sleep over the risks as long as you're careful. Um, so this is where we're trying to be a little um, uh, more pragmatic uh, from the more theoretical discussions that we had at the very beginning. So, so as this, as this uh, webinar has gone on, it's gotten a little more concrete and pragmatic. So it, it is true that uh, uh, copyright does provide, allow the rights holder to recover actual damages, for example, lost licensing fees. Um, the rights holder can also get what is called statutory damages. Um, and for cases of willful infringement, the statutory damages could be up to uh, $150,000 per work infringed, but that's to the, 
to the discretion, at the discretion of the judge, as the amount the judge considers just. Uh, there are also criminal penalties, but you really need to be a very, very bad actor. And to my knowledge, no uh, librarian or teacher has ever been prosecuted for copyright infringement. Um, now, there was a lot of attention in the, uh, in, the, in the early part of the 21st century when uh, 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 record labels were suing users who were engaged in file sharing. Um, they were really trying to clamp down on the, the people, not only the Napsters of the world, but also the people who were using services like Napster, especially the people who were uploading. There was, uh, 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 and, and in some of those cases, the damages that were awarded uh, were quite significant. Uh, and so, you know, certainly a lot of you who were in college at the time or were, who were uh, sort of being trained at the time, uh, you, you might be aware of those cases. And, you know, th th that did seep into the, into the consciousness of people that, that, you know, that, 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 that the rights holders could get very, very aggressive and pursue these damages. Also, many of you have heard about this, uh, the, the recent decision in uh, Dinah study versus the Houston School District, where there was uh, the Houston School District engaged in the systematic copying of, uh, of worksheets, uh, went to, to trial, a jury awarded a lot of damages against Houston, something around $9 million. But in many ways, um, uh, that case is really the exception that proves the rule. Uh, it, it, it really is, goes to what Meredith was talking about. The, the, that, that case involved um, uh, uh, sort of like the systematic large scale copying of commercial worksheets. I mean, you know, worksheets are pr prepared on a commercial basis by an educational publisher. The uh, people knew what they were doing was unlawful. There was all kinds of evidence that they were aware that what they were doing was unlawful, and they did it anyway. And so in, in situations like that, it's not that surprising that a jury would, uh, would rule against them. On the other hand, um, uh, you know, the, 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 in your more typical case, uh, uh, you, you know, th th there isn't going to be this kind of willful infringement, so the amount of damages that are even, actual damages that are even theoretically possible is much less. But also, um, the, 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 there is an exception to the statutory damages rule, and that is that if a, a teacher is uh, acting in a good faith belief that their activity was fair use, then statutory damages are not even available. So then you go back to actual damages, which really could be very little, at most some licensing fees. What that means is, is as a practical matter, uh, teachers and educational systems are almost never sued. Um, and, uh, uh, and when they are sued, again, it's, it's really in an egregious situation like the Dinah study uh, versus Houston School District. Um, and because the, from the rights holder perspective, when they bring suit against an educational, uh, a, you know, a, a school district or a teacher, again, they're rarely going to go after the teacher because they know the teacher is basically judgment proof, uh, sadly. Um, and so they'd be going after the school district or, or the institution, uh, the university, for example, and there's other limitations when you're going after state-run institutions that we don't need to get into here. But the, 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 from a practical point of view, the rights holder is only going to go and sue someone if they really think that there's a chance of a recovery. And uh, they're also going to be very aware of adverse publicity. And so they're only going to go after um, an educational institution if they really think they have a slam dunk. If it's sort of a gray area, they're not going to do it because the cost of litigation 
is too high and the cost of going after an educational institution that people basically like and judges like, um, they realize that the possibility of adverse publicity is too great. There was recently a case where um, uh, uh, a school was holding a fundraiser, so clearly not an educational activity, right? And that gets back to Meredith's earlier point. A school was having holding a fundraiser. Uh, it was during a time when there would be kids around, and so they announced that they would be screening a Disney video. Well, the arm of the, uh, uh, the, the licensing arm sort of actually, uh, I think they just sent a cease and desist letter. I'm not sure that they actually filed suit against the school for doing this kind of public performance, but not in a classroom. Um, the adverse publicity that they got was enormous, and the, 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 whether it was Disney or its, or its licensing agency, whatever, they ended up making a contribution to the school. Uh, because they, the adverse publicity was so great. So e even in that case where it really wasn't even arguably a fair use, um, it fell clearly outside of the exception, the 1101 exception. Nonetheless, even there, you know, there was this, uh, there was uh, 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 pushback. And then there was another case that we were talking about earlier um, when we were preparing this webinar, where there was, uh, um, uh, a glee club instructor put together a, um, a melody, a, a, a medley rather, of different songs, um, and they were sued. And the, uh, the the court was so outraged that they were sued because the court said, "Well, this is such an obvious fair use, given the small amount of that was used." And again, this sort of, even though it was a, a performance, it was sort of in an educational setting. The, the, the court awarded attorney's fees against the rights holder so that they that the 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 attorney's fees so that the uh the the educational institution was able to recover its attorney's fees and so rights holders are aware that there's a, it's very risky to sue um uh, to sue uh, educators um and they have to really have a very very clear strong case and not any one of these cases where on the margins or a gray area or where there's really any doubt. Another point that I'll mention is just a very practical matter. Um, a rights holder can only sue about an infringement they're aware of, right? Now, the internet makes things a lot more visible. So, so in that example I gave you before of, uh, of the fundraiser, I think the way Disney or it's a licensing agency found out about it was because the um, uh, the uh, uh, the fundraiser was promoted online, and um, uh, and and so they were able to detect the fact that they were going to be performing, you know, because the the invitation said, "Oh, we'll be performing," you know, "we'll be screening this video at the fundraiser." They were the Disney was able to detect that this was going on. Now, uh, the, for the vast majority of your activities, um, it's going to be really hard for a rights holder to ever detect that. Now, that doesn't. I'm not sort of encouraging you to go crazy, but in terms of your risk analysis, um, if it's going to be purely on Blackboard or some other kind of uh, closed system where only your students are going to see it. Uh, where there's that degree of security, the, the, the risk of detection, therefore the risk of infringement, is much smaller. On the other hand, if you post things on the open internet, you post it on YouTube, or you post it on Facebook, or you have a website, your school has a website, and you're posting things on the website that are viewable by the world, well, obviously that is going to be a much riskier proposition. And so you need to as you're engaged in this, you know, kind of need to balance all these things together. Um, Thank you. So if we go to the, the next slide, please. So uh, what's, what's important here also is, um, you know, a lot of times people are not only worried about the possibility of, uh, of being sued, but they're worried about how they'll be uh, viewed within their profession. 
and um, uh, and and I think again the 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 solution here is to understand what is acceptable and what isn't. Uh, uh, and before the people were talking about plagiarism, and I think that that's is really important again always to keep in mind the difference between copyright infringement and plagiarism. And you want to and and, and plagiarism is, is a much greater sin. Uh, in an educational and academic setting, of course, and infringement and certainly fair use is not something that one should uh, at all be hesitant for from a professional point of view. Um, now that that is to be sure, there are institutions that are pretty conservative and that always want to license things or always want to get permission. Um, and I think again, the solution there is to make sure that the people, you know, whether it's the, the in-house lawyer or the administrator, that they have sort of current up-to-date understandings. Um, as Peter was indicating before, fair use has changed a lot. Um, uh, it's changed a lot since I went to law school. Um, and, and so, but a lot of people, a lot of lawyers are still sort of stuck in what they learned when they went to law school in the 1980s. Uh, and not aware that fair use now is very different from fair use in the 1980s and allows uh, much more and has much more uh, flexibility than it did in the 1980s. Uh, and, and so I think the final point, you know, that, that really ties all this together is that um, uh, it, it's important for uh, uh, teachers uh, administrators and all the other people involved in the enterprise to really have a clear understanding of fair use and copyright, uh, what is permitted, what is not permitted, the real risks as opposed to the perceived risks, and uh, it, it's important uh, uh, to support staff who really want to try to use the copyrighted material uh, to uh, engage students, uh, particularly in this very challenging period. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and so, you know, I think Jonathan provided a really good context about why um, the risk for teachers and for schools and for universities is really limited. And I think um, that's an important point. And it's important to keep, I think, clear two crucial distinctions from that. One is the distinction between activities that often grab headlines for which there is no fair use rationale given. These are just people who are choosing to ignore the law. And those are the situations that Jonathan mentioned where there is real risk and there have been real damages. And I think in contrast, where we have not seen that is in situations where people have thought about what their educational mission is have thought about fair use and have made a reasonable distinction. And the, those two categories are very important to keep separate. And the second thing I think is the discussion of whether you're do something, doing something sort of broadly in public um, via YouTube or streaming or a website versus um, through an LMS or through another method that's designed to limit it to your classroom. And there, I think it's very important to focus on two questions, which is, you know, are you limiting this to your reasonably to the audience that is your classroom or your school? But at the same time, when you're thinking through that, to make sure that the steps you're taking to limit that access don't in any way reduce access for students with disabilities or students with um, limited access to bandwidth or technology like right now we're dealing with no, a lot of students who aren't acting um in their normal capacity they don't have um the access to bandwidth at home they may not have a device and in those situations you want to be very careful that you're not um putting things out only through an lms if doing so limits access for um any of the students who it's your mission to serve. I wanted to give Peter a moment to talk about sort of how to place questions about educational fair use 
in the emergency, in the larger context of fair use. And then I'm going to tell you about a couple of upcoming webinars we're doing on specific topics, and then we're going to answer some questions. So Peter, would you like to speak briefly? Thank you, Meredith. And I, 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 we're anxious to get to questions, so I won't say much, except to emphasize that I think the, the content of, of, of this week's webinar, last week's webinar on reading aloud, and the upcoming webinars in this series, which you will all have received announcements of, and which I hope you will, you will consider joining us for over the coming weeks, all of these are, are intended not only to underline how appropriate the reliance on fair use has become, as educators try in this in this moment of emergency to move online a whole range of practices that have previously been reserved for the physical classroom this is a moment at which one should be able to rely with special confidence on the fair use doctrine why because in addition to the ordinary educational purpose that undergirds your activities, there is now another objective, which is to meet the needs of the emergency, which would factor into a fair use analysis. So we're, we're, we wanna make that point. And next week's webinars, I think, are gonna be particularly addressed to the question of what can be done in the emergency. But we also wanna point out that the framework of what we're saying, which has been the, the, the emphasis today, is not simply for these difficult times, that the fundamental analysis that we've been presenting and will continue to present over these weeks to come should have real bearing on the use of copyrighted material in teaching practice, including practice online, after the emergency. Why? Well, because that's what the general legal principles are say, but also for another reason, which is important to remember and that I think we're being reminded of, and that is that to different extents, for to in, in different ways, many of the the students we we seek to address are always living in emergency circumstances. That whether we are talking about disabled students who need accessible materials, or whether we're talking about students who lack the, the personal um, um, access to the technologies that so many of us take for granted, whether we are talking about individuals who come to education with other challenges, for them, the emergency continues. And we need to continue to try to meet it. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we have a number of questions, some of which were submitted ahead of time that we're going to go over, and some of which um, are submitted in the Q&A. If you have questions that you'd like to submit in the Q&A, um, please feel free to do so. Uh, I want to briefly um, share with you the information about the upcoming webinars. So um, we have a series of webinars that have been planned and um, you should be able to see them now. And so we have uh, a series of webinars addressing basically the process of finding and creating resilient digital materials for K through 12 teaching and learning. So that will cover um, copyright and open education strategies for finding and creating teaching and learning materials that can be digital and print and that can be flexible in these times and beyond, as Peter said. The first one of those is this Friday. 
April 17th at noon Eastern time. And it's on educational fair use during the COVID-19 emergency, focusing on sort of questions of, yes, you can scan, what things you can do in the emergency to enable K through 12 education. Uh, the next one focuses on, um, it's on the next Friday, there's gonna be each Friday, the next is Friday, April 24th, focusing on finding teaching materials for fall 2020 and beyond. And that webinar will go through how you find and evaluate digital teaching and learning materials from open sources and open educational resources and commercial sources and thinking through what you can do with those materials, how you can adapt them and how you can implement them. So that's for teachers and librarians and district leaders who are thinking about what they're going to do for summer and fall 2020. And then finally, on May 1st, we have a webinar at noon on creating teaching materials. So how your district could create teaching materials, either open educational resources or others, using both materials created within the district and also when appropriate, relying on fair use for included materials for images and excerpts and illustrations. So those are every Friday, starting this Friday at noon. There's a link here to register, and I'll also be sending all of this information out in the post webinar email that you'll get. Please feel free to share this widely. Um, we're also running two standalone webinars, one on universal design, which is focused on sort of the big picture of how we use copyright, open educational resources, and that whole set of tools to make sure that we are providing equitable access to all students during this transition to online teaching. And then finally, one on a sort of narrower, dare I say, slightly nerdier copyright topic, which is um, how these copyright uh, legal provisions operate across borders. So one thing people often say is, well, fair use is fine, but that's only in the United States. But actually, when you look at this core set of teaching and learning purposes, this is something that every country's copyright law acknowledges is a valuable thing. And so in fact, the provisions of copyright law that allow for quotation and allow for study in every country line up to allow mostly the same set of activities for teaching and learning. So that's the information about the upcoming webinars. And now we'll go through a couple of the questions that were submitted ahead of time and also um, some of the ones that have been submitted live. And so uh, for the people who are going to be answering questions, if you can go ahead and unmute your video just so that we can see you, that would be great. And so the first question that we were going to address is a question that was submitted about um, sort of how to think through fair use beyond this webinar. And so we often get this question of like, okay, you've convinced me that sometimes I can rely on fair use, but now I'm in my classroom or I'm in my office or I'm in my dining room or the really quiet closet in the back where I now work and I need to think to through about what to do next. So what do you do to sort of take some next steps on actually implementing fair use in your work, Peter? Peter, you're muted. <laughs> now, that's better. There we go. I think there are a couple of things that you should get into the habit of doing as you work with fair use and, and, and try to build your confidence in doing so. One of them is, is very simple, but uh, good discipline nevertheless, and that is, as you're thinking through a fair use problem, should I, can I, will I include this material? It's a good thing to actually take some notes just for your, for your own use, for your file, about those two central questions that I mentioned earlier as being the key to fair use analysis. What's your transformative purpose? And why is the amount you're using an appropriate amount? And I'm not talking about 
you know, a legal memo. I'm not talking even about a, a page. I'm talking about a few sentences. Obviously, if you're doing the same kind of fair use from instance to instance, you don't constantly have to repeat the exercise. But it's, it's good to have a record. And it's also good mental discipline to think through. The other thing I would say, and it's already been, been Christina uh, suggested it earlier as, as, as well as, as Will, and that is it's good to build a community around these questions. You ought to have fair use friends. You ought to have people who are similarly situated to you, whether in your, your school or in your district or online, with whom you can discuss these matters. Finally, Although I can't unfortunately tell you that our Fair Use Best Practices Project, which was mentioned earlier, has yet produced a comprehensive set of guidance materials for every aspect of online education. There are some very useful documents in that series, um, uh, Best Practices in Fair Use for for K through 12 media, edu media literacy education, uh, a, a fair use best practices for poetry, which talks a lot about fair use and poetry in the physical and virtual classroom, a wonderful fair use best practices for visual arts, a lot of which is concerned with the, the use of visual art, copyrighted graphic and and, and sculptural material, as well as video and photography in the classroom setting. And there's also quite a bit in the research libraries, fair use best practices that bears directly on these questions. So there are a lot of very reliable, as well as, as Christina indicated earlier, some less reliable resources out there. And meanwhile, we're working away on a similar document for, for OER that we hope you will have access to in, in as, you know, you know, for sometime in the summer. So that's, I, those are, I think, the first things I would say. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And Christina was going to talk a little bit. One of the things we've seen in the open educational resources community is how for teachers having a group of teachers either at your school or other schools has really helped. Can you talk about that a little, Christina? Yeah, so in the work uh, with Go Open at the U.S. Department of Education and then continuing that work over at New America, we strongly suggest that, that districts approach this with a team. And so that includes folks from the district level and kind of the administration and the leadership level. So there's buy-in there, but then there's also folks in the classroom so that it's not just grassroots and not top down, but that everyone kind of in between um, including specialists. So we want to make sure that school librarians are included in this. We want to make sure that um, our special education and our EL um, content area specialists can also help with this. And then it just becomes kind of that natural team where you can phone a friend and phone your fair use friend and, and kind of, you know, consider the four factors of fair use as a team instead of it just being relying upon that one person. And as I will, I will always advocate for school librarians in this they know this information they are trained in curation and they can help us so much and they're a huge asset that we so often overlook and i know that there are also you know like school districts that have cut those positions particularly in california and some other states that face a lot of budget um, concerns that's fine here's a natural um, opportunity for a partnership with public librarians then or your institutions of higher education to tap into some scholarly communications librarians there are ways for you to, to seek out additional support when it comes to this. And so we've just seen kind of having that team within school districts can certainly help, but then even the network of, of schools that are doing this work. So we've got, we've identified over 300 school districts that are using OER. And so there's a Facebook page for this, there's a, there's a Twitter handle and there's a Twitter hashtag, you know, so people are posting kind of scenarios um, that I'm seeing here in the Q&A or even just specific questions and kind of feeling that with the community and crowdsourcing that before, you know, anything else, which has been great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so a question for you, Will, is 
we've heard a lot of about a discussion here about text and about images, but uh, what about music? What about using music in a classroom? What about using music as part of a presentation? Can you tell us a little bit about how you should think about music in this fair use analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so people sometimes talk about music as if it's this big sort of bugbear in copyright because it's the, the sort of metaphysics of is it a cover or is it the sheet music or the composition can feel complicated. But in fact, the same underlying laws apply to our use of music as they do anything else. I mentioned section 1101 that lets you perform or display that's a picture or a song or a video or anything else, right? So, so the laws tend to treat use of music in education the same way they treat everything else uh, with the same sort of broad protections. Uh, I think John did a great job of talking through some of the, the way that the sort of specter of these scary cases from the early aughts often haunt copyright decision makers, especially maybe of our generation who grew up with Napster or LimeWire or Kazaa or whatever it is. Um, but, but the way that there isn't sub, sort of commercial substitution in this context pretty clearly distinguishes a lot of those cases and that the incentive structure to sue an individual teacher or even a school system is it weighs so heavily against a lawsuit, again, in the way that John talked about, um, that I, I, I think sort of my first suggestion is what I think you offered as well, which is like, relax, breathe, it's gonna be okay. Uh, the other wrinkle I'll add is that it's hard not to throw in a plug for CC at this point as well, right? If, if you're looking for some cool background music for the video and you don't care what song it is, the sites like CC Mixter have lots and lots of really good openly licensed music to make it even easier to do. On the other hand, when you say, no, I need this specific song, this is a student writing about the song they get up and go to, you know, their swim practice every morning for, that's when your fair use argument is strongest, when you need a particular song to, to do the sort of the pedagogical work as well. So you're in a great situation where if you need something specific, fair use probably has your back. And if you just need something general, there's a great body of openly licensed resources along with fair use maybe having your back. It's a longer answer, but. Since we're doing plugs, let me plug something else. We mentioned before that this, this uh, webinar was not going to be primarily about public domain resources, but there are some amazing public domain resources available in the area of music. And one of them, and you can, you can, you can Google it, um, if you see, if you see fit, is the Music Library Association's Public Domain Song Anthology, MLA Public Domain Song Anthology, which is a wonderful collection of materials that are make it easy to both perform and to teach the standards which are part of the Great American Songbook. And it has many, many educational applications, and and it, it should be in every school library, in my view. Thank you, Peter. Um, another question that I wanted to answer that had come up was a question that had been asked about using OER. So um, we'll talk about these in the upcoming webinars, and I've put the um, link to web register for those in the um, chat. It's not showing up as a link. I can't tell you why. Um, but those webinars will talk specifically about finding and using OER. But just as a preview, OER are open educational resources that are put out under a copyright license that says you can use them for any purpose. And so that includes making as many copies. You can print them. You can deliver them digitally. You can alter them. So they work in concert with fair use because they're not gonna replace being able to access existing creative stuff, but they are materials that have been intentionally created with this open license that you can use for any purpose. Um, we're about five minutes over, so we're gonna answer a few more questions. We're not gonna to get to all of them today, but we will cover them in these upcoming webinars. And so please do sign up. Um, I'm gonna pull a few quick ones and if I don't get to your question, I apologize. It may be because it was such a good question that we can't do it justice in this. So it'll be in upcoming webinars and the guidance. We'll email this all out. Um, one of the questions, Peter, that I thought maybe you'd be willing to answer was um, for people who are trying to deal with this emergency of access, if there's a student who needs their materials in a different format, like a student who is print disabled, and needs a book that is recorded, 
And there might be an audiobook somewhere, but it's not clear how the school district would get a copy of that because a lot of them aren't licensed to schools. And so they have a student who would need materials read aloud. And is that something that fair use might enable if it's a core part of the teaching material and there's not a copy that's accessible to that student? Would you be willing to talk about how to think that through? I think so. And, and I'm going to make the assumption in this case, and you tell me if I'm, I'm correct or not, that the goal would be to use an existing recording that isn't specifically licensed, or would the, would the goal be to record it? You, you, yeah, so okay. Both, As to the right? latter, that's very easy. Um, the, the, not only the, the case law, but also the, the legislative history, the, the, the background records of the 1976 Copyright Act make it very clear that providing accessible texts to, uh, to people with, with, with various kinds of relevant disabilities, in particular uh, visual impairments or, or other perceptual disabilities, is, is a sweet spot in the law of fair use. So I would never hesitate in a situation like the one you describe to make that recording. And honestly, I would have to say that's not, that, that statement is not applicable just to the present emergency. Great, thank you, Peter. Well, I was gonna tee up two questions for you. One was, I'm gonna tell you on both and you can think about how to answer them. One question is, um, what about both now and going forward, teachers linking to existing stuff out there on the web where you don't know it's copyright provenance? You, you don't know if they have permission. You don't, you, you might have suspicions one way or the other, but it's not the Pirate Bay in Napster and it's not the Library of Congress. It is the giant middle spectrum where you're trying to just, you know, figure your way through. So that's question is about linking. And then the other question, I guess, would be, does fair use apply in situations other than just one teacher to their students? So if you're creating materials for your district, can you also rely on fair use? Would you be willing to take a stab at those? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the easy one first. Um, we talked about the way that copyright isn't a blanket ability to stop everyone from doing everything with a work. And this is a great example. Copyright law doesn't limit your ability to link to something in the same way it doesn't limit your ability to point to a sign on the side of the road or something, right? You're not making a copy, you're not publicly performing, etc. Um, so linking, generally speaking, is fine. You alluded to the sort of the potential uncertainty in that, which is if you link to Joe's Pirate Place of Illegal Wares.com, you probably should know better. Yes, with a Z, exactly, yes. Um, and so there, there's a level past which the, a court would start to say, you, you probably should have known that. You're doing something a little more knowingly or, or willfully in that way. Um, so, so when I get that question from teachers, I often talk about it as an opportunity to do some sort of information literacy connection, right? Like when, when you do information literacy, what is the purpose of that site? What is the perspective it's coming from? What's happening there? Do that same sort of information literacy when you're deciding what to link to. If it's from, you know, the College of Law, if it's from Pidgeot, well, they're pretty trustworthy. I think they've got good stuff. I'm totally comfortable linking to their stuff, whether or not it has a CC license on it. If it's Joe's House of Wares, maybe I wouldn't feel so comfortable, both because maybe there's some potential attenuated legal liability, but more because like, let's model good behavior, right? So that's the linking question. Short answer, yeah, that's totally fine. Longer answer is, let's be responsible, right? Um, the second question is about sort of extending fair use not to one to one or one teacher to one set of students, but to a larger community. Um, and the answer there is that fair use is always sort of on the table. It's always something you can consider um, and think about using that same set of questions that we've already described. Sort of what's your purpose? Um, is it transformative or not? And then is the, is the amount used sort of appropriate? And then is there any sort of market harm or substitution thing happening? Um, and there are tons and tons of examples where um, fair use applies to situations that are about working at the system level, working at sort of a group level in different ways, um, uploading a video to YouTube, and making it available publicly, we can rely on fair use. Um, if we had had some images in these slides, 
we're putting them on the open web. I think we could still rely on fair use. That's right. You have you have a picture in the background. I have uh, an image from the place behind me as well. Um, I'm confidently relying on fair use for that purpose as well. So no, fair use, because it's the exceptional exception, it's not cabined in or confined to this specific person doing this specific thing. It's a generalized sort of safety valve or safety net or a source of empowerment to do socially serving things. Blow the bugle on it. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm looking through, I think. Uh, may, I, may I get in there and add one tiny thing, which is we talked earlier about, Christina made such a good point about how sometimes teachers are reluctant to engage in this kind of practice because they fear that they're not modeling the best of behavior for their students. And we, we've heard that a lot and I respect it greatly. But all of the kinds of reasoning, all of the kinds of thinking through, all of the kinds of decision making about fair use that we have been discussing are things that can be modeled for students. And particularly when they come up, not in terms of the material that's going, so to speak, from the front of the room to the back of the room, the lesson or the, the supporting materials. When these issues come up, as they do in connection with student projects, then that's a wonderful opportunity to model the best of good behavior, lawful and respectful behavior with students. So this is something what, what one can, and in my view, should talk about. Too often, I think, copyright lessons for, for students, especially in K through 12, are, are lessons about, um, they're lessons in all the different flavors and varieties of no. And this is a different kind of copyright lesson, but in a way, it's perhaps the most important lesson that you could teach. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm gonna, there's a couple of questions here that have asked about the relationship between um, the Teach Act and permission and fair use. And I might take an opportunity to address that and also to share a, a graphic that I've created that actually doesn't include the TEACH Act in it and so is a little bit incomplete but might nonetheless be potentially partially useful. And so this is thinking through this question of do I get, you know, sort of what is your decision tree? And as Will mentioned earlier, so these questions are like do I need to get permission to do a read aloud or I want to do a read aloud with where the author permission doesn't clearly allow me, or do I need to follow those rules? Or there's a question about um, the Teach Act. And to think through that, you have to sort of think through from most general to least general. And so the first most general question is, is this thing I want to do protected by the copyright law at all? And there's some big buckets of things that are not protected. So things that are in the public domain, right? Things that have passed into the public domain because they are old enough that they are no longer protected by copyright law. Then it doesn't matter whether you have permission or whether you are acting in the confines of fair use. Another question is things that are just not protectable subject matter. So ideas, you do not ever need permission to talk about the ideas in something, right? Copyright owners, do not own the ideas. They only own the expression. So as Will said, modeling attribution for those ideas might be a very important ethical obligation, but the copyright holder in that does not own the ability to write about them, does not have some copyright to prevent you from that. So once you've decided though, yes, this is a written thing, I need to have a copyright answer, then Fair use and other copyright limitations exist sort of alongside each other. And it's important to remember that the TEACH Act is one definite path forward, but if you don't feel clear that you can do what you wanna do under the TEACH Act, fair use is also available to you. So if you feel confident that fair use permits what you're doing, you're using it for a new purpose, 
then you don't need to fit within the strict confines of the Teach Act. And then finally, if you think, I don't think that fair use allows me to do this, and I don't think a specific provision of the Teach Act does, then you can think through other ways to get permission. That can be a Creative Commons license, it can be an institutional license or subscription, it can be this sort of vague, allowed, ignored, tolerated classroom use, or it can be individual one-to-one -one permission. So while it is um, generous and publicly minded for people to give permission for people to read aloud their works in this emergency, if you're, as we talk about for an hour and a half in our other webinar, um, if you are doing so for a clear teaching purpose, you're explaining it to your students, you're talking it through, you're building and extending your physical classroom to keep these kids who are disrupted, focused and feeling like something is stable, there are a lot of times when you don't need that permission. And so it's good that they gave it, but you don't need to feel like you have to stick to just that boundary if you have a fair use. Separately, if you're just reading aloud because you want to have a read aloud channel and you don't have a teaching purpose, then yeah, you do need to read those permissions carefully and think through them. And that's, I think, a really important distinction, which is, there are situations where you're like, I don't know, I just feel like doing that. And in those situations, you may not have a fair use rationale. And so even though the activities look the same, if the purposes are different, fair use might permit one, but not the other. Um, and on that note, we're sort of significantly over time. So I am going to uh, allow anyone who'd like to make a sort of closing uh, note and um, so maybe we'll go around and we could do uh, Peter, then Will, then Christine, and then anyone else who is speaking who'd like to unmute their video and hop in. Peter? Well, um, I won't try to sum up everything, but I will say I'll take this chance to say one more thing about the relationship of fair use to the TEACH Act, which can be problematic. And that is one of the reasons that the TEACH Act is hard to use in that it's full of very sort of uh, difficult to satisfy small conditions that that um, are not part of section 1101 on the for the physical classroom and also aren't part of fair use so sometimes quite often in fact teachers ask well isn't it so that in order to that in order to make a fair use of a work uh, um, online, I need to have a lawfully acquired copy, whatever that means. And the answer is no, that that is a Teach Act requirement. And it's the difficulty of the concept and its interpretation and application is one of the things that makes the Teach Act less than useful in ordinary classroom settings but it is not a fair use requirement. And so not only should one understand in thinking about online education that the fair use doctrine supplements and complements the specific exceptions, including the TEACH Act, but one should also understand that they don't limit the operation of the fair use doctrine. Thank you, Peter. Will, would you have any final thoughts for the audience? Sure, I'll, I'll finish the way I often finish these sort of presentations with, with two, I, I think, high level things that I really want you to take away. The first is that copyright is not as complicated as people sometimes make it seem. That you can get into the weeds with copyright like, like you can with anything, but the fundamentals, as we've described today, I hope feel less mysterious than they did and less daunting than they might have. And the second is that copyright loves education and educators. It's a system designed to support that stuff. If you are doing the sort of thing, a thoughtful, ethical, good teacher or librarian or media specialist or any person in education, copyright more likely than not, you're in the right ballpark. You're doing the right sort of thing. So, so copyright isn't as scary as some people might think it is and copyright loves and supports the really important work that you're doing. I hope you took away those things, if nothing else. Thanks, Will. Christina? My only thing would be join us for the rest of the series, um, because whenever you think about copyright in the classroom, and I promise you I've been there, 
um, to when you want to look at alternatives, um, we're going to talk about OER. And I'm excited about that because there are options out there for people to consider where you don't have to worry about copyright. And if you are making content, we want to show you more about that too. So hope you all join us for the rest of that series. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I guess uh, then I have the moderator privilege of going last. Um, and what I would sort of echo what Christina said, maybe that this webinar here was the most abstract we're going to get about copyright in the entire thing. We wanted to give everybody sort of a foundation. And in order to do that, we went a little deep. Um, but the webinars that come up, the following three are really designed to be um, concrete, you know, steps and analysis that you can use, not a lot of sort of, you know, the philosophical underpinnings of copyright. No, it's good to have, but these are going to be questions about what can I do in the next six weeks? What can I do going forward? How can I find these resilient digital teaching materials that will prepare me for uncertain shifts from online to in-person. And if I look out there and I think there are materials that I really want for teaching that aren't there, how can teachers and districts work together to create those materials as part of the open educational resources community? So um, on that note, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for coming and we hope to see you again on Friday. Have a great day.